So on today's episode of Who Put an Electric Computer on a Mechanical Diesel, we try and save like 600 plus dollars. Well, the ECM and the old 12 valve finally gave out. Might as well scrap it. Now being that it's a mechanical diesel, there's not a whole lot that the ECM runs in this thing. It's a 94 OBD1. However, the ECM does control the alternator, the speedometer, and the tachometer. So, and there's ways to bypass most of that, but I kind of want to have that odometer working just so I can keep racking up more miles. Now this thing didn't completely just fail immediately. It actually, over time, the speedometer sort of intermittently started having some issues, and it was actually reading lower than it should have. I thought it was something up with the speed sensor down on the transmission, but after about a couple of months, everything just gave out. So we can go online, try and find some good deals on these things, or box it up and ship it out to Origins Unknown to get rebuilt. But screw that. I mean, if you could change the oil, why not rebuild an ECM yourself? Now, in addition to being changing every year or two, these computers are also apparently different between manual and automatic transmissions. So good luck ever trying to find one that's exactly what you need. So basically, we're in the tear down and find out what the heck we don't know stage. Got the cover here, and inside is not what I was expecting. There's a whole bunch of silicone gel or epoxy of some sort covering the entire circuit board. Thought maybe that there would just be something obvious in here, a bad capacitor or burnt component, but can't even see anything. A lot of old dirt. Now believe me, first thought is basically just start ripping and tearing at this stuff. But basically, I don't think there's any way you're going to remove all of this flexible crud unless you can dissolve it. Maybe we can tear out some chunks here. And we'll drop it into a couple uh, different things and see what dissolves it. So after consulting the interwebs, because you got to use all the tools at your disposal, isopropyl alcohol is one thing that may dissolve this. So the acetone didn't put a dent in it. We tried heat and that just started burning stuff rather than trying to melt or soften it. But started going over the board and just trying to see if, well, if there was a certain area that looked more suspicious than anything else. And that's when I was looking here up at the top there by those capacitors. And it might be hard to see, but there's some weird black marks and it looks like the potting in there has already started to separate from the edge. There's a suspicious black streak. So what do you got to lose? We're going to start trying to carefully peel that back with a, well this popsicle stick kind of sucks, but maybe a chopstick or a shish kebab stick. Now as we was carefully trying to dig out this potting here, I noticed that this uh, capacitor, it was kind of loose like that. I believe it should be actually anchored down in there. I mean, I'm thinking that right there. Well, we might be on to something. Now, I'm not an electronical expert, but I don't believe that's supposed to be like that. Yeah, that looks pretty nasty and burnt down there. Now, it looks like the writing and identification marks on the capacitor are, are sort of gone. Looks like they got stuck in the silicone potting. But we were able to piece together the old pieces of silicone and sort of read what was left in there. That always comes in handy. Well, everything I can find I can't see any good way to actually dissolve this potting. We're just going to have to dig it out. And at this point, we're using a sharp butter knife to try and remove the entire circuit board from the plastic housing. Easier said than done. 
Don't know if it's going to help or not. But we sprayed some WD-40 in along the edge there just to try and give this thing some lubricant to pop it free. All right, that did the trick. <laughs> yeah, that might be a problem there. Oh wow, there's some other spots too. And the amount of damage there looks substantial. Well, this is definitely bad. There's some other mystery component there on the left that has completely burned up. In addition to, there's some empty holes there. That could have been another component, which is just no longer there. Oof. Did some further research online about different styles ECUs. And as maybe you would have guessed, this type of ECU box is actually used on other Chrysler products. I found out that a lot of the older Jeeps have the same basic, you know, the shell looks the same. However, the circuit boards are different, but they have these same type of problems on those ECUs. And there's even kits out there that they sell that's a four pack or so of those capacitors that you replace on the board. Because that seems to be far and away the most common problem that you run into on something like this. You can actually get resistors and caps pretty cheap if you buy them in bulk. Uh, it was like six bucks for this and under 10 bucks for all these different caps. And they should have had enough to pretty much do a normal rebuild. So I'm far from the first person to try and work on an ECU like this. However, the old 12 valve computers definitely seem to be a lot less commonly worked on uh, as compared to the gas engines. And after doing some more looking on the board and the amount of damage, some of the printed circuits on here are completely dissolved and gone. And also, at the ECU connector here, something happened and it burned across a whole bunch of terminals where the main connector attaches. Now to me, I think that's basically almost a death sentence for this board. You can get really creative if you have to, trying to make some additional runs, but I couldn't find any type of a wiring diagram for this board. So all the pieces that are missing and the circuits that are gone over here, well, that's going to be a lot of uh, trial and error to try and make those work again. And unfortunately, I think this board is basically a lost cause. Not going to throw it out because, well, you never know. Keep it in stock. But even if you sent this out to one of those repair places that offer a couple hundred dollar rebuild, I'd say there's a good chance this one would have been one of the ones that they say are unrepairable just due to the fact that it wasn't a simple capacitor replacement. At the end of the road with this thing, and some people might say, see, that was a waste of time even messing with it. I don't think you can be further from the truth. Had nothing to lose actually getting in here, experimenting, and trying to find out what the problem is. Confirmed some of the common areas of failure on boards like these, and we're pretty much the whole way there to fix it if that was actually the case. Next time a circuit board fails because of a bad capacitor or another simple component on there, well, you'll be ready to figure it out and fix it. Getting experience and learning about stuff like this, that's always valuable. So don't always just be content with when something's a mystery black box and, you know, you can't dare touch what's inside or try and figure it out. Got to leave that to the experts. Don't let not knowing how to do something stop you from doing it. And if you're wondering about the truck, well, you really don't need a computer on a 12 valve. We're just converting it all over to manual operation. Maybe that'll be a future episode. Gonna have to install at least one of these voltage reducers to get some 5 volt or 6 volt outputs for the speedometer and the tax signal. And the alternator, that'll get controlled by a traditional voltage regulator that, well, Chrysler used for like a few decades. And while we're on a roll with working on broken ECUs, this one was from the old 88 F-150. Happened to already have a spare one sitting in the back of the truck for when this went bad. Uh, they're really pretty cheap on Rock Auto. But this one's just sitting here, so let's tear into it. Oof, breaking the seal. Oh man, I just extended the warranty on that truck. Well, and there's the circuit board. And if you start looking closely, there's some staining. Look at that, right around the capacitor. There's also some around that capacitor. And one more down there, but that doesn't appear to be leaking. Just decode the capacitors. Go around to the back, find where they are. Unsolder them, put some new ones in. 
good chance she's as good as rebuilt. And if it's not the capacitors, start looking around for some of the next most likely culprits. Look for any damage, any smoke, discoloration, exploded parts. Corrosion too, that'll get you. I actually helped repair a skid loader circuit board that was for the display and alarm lights and all that type of stuff. The mice had gotten up in behind the dash and the mouse, the mouse nest had corroded and actually eaten through some of the printed circuit board uh, circuits. So basically was able to go in with the, some really thin wires, solder them to the place where it ended, jumper it over to where it should have went, and lo and behold, the circuit board was working back in action. It can sometimes be a mechanical issue with an electrical part. Like I said, anytime you can learn a procedure or something to look for the next time around that you encounter a problem like this, you're better off for it. Yeah, you can just spend money and throw your wallet at the problem, but that might always not work for you. What happens if this part was completely unobtainium? It took zero dollars investment to go through these and learn the ins and outs of them a bit. And the same principles apply to that old stereo you're trying to revive, or who knows what other type of component. At the end of the day, not everything turns out like a movie with some happy miracle ending. So next time, when a repair might actually go the right way and it's able to be fixed, that won't just be luck. That'll actually be a little bit of gained knowledge from previous experience and learning the hard way.